Amen. Joshua, chapter 1 was awesome. Amen? 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 I know it's nighttime, and I know you work today, but don't be napping already. We haven't even started yet, all right? So we've talked about, we had a good overview. If you were not here last week, uh, I know that DVDs will probably be here on Sunday. Grab them. But it was a transition that we saw from Moses to Joshua. And what's amazing is Moses was probably the most irreplaceable man ever outside of the Lord himself. Moses was the one who had bought, brought them out of bondage. Moses was the one who talked to God and spoke to them. Moses was the one that even though they got angry with him at times, there was a peace in knowing that Moses was there, that Moses was talking to God, that Moses was leading the way, that Moses was keeping them on track. But it's just proof that no one's irreplaceable. And it's not men that we follow, but the Lord that we follow. And we saw in the first chapter of Joshua just a powerful picture of this man that God had chosen to take his place. A man who had been faithful, a man who had, who had stood by Moses' side, who never imagined that he would one day, you know, because he was a slave in Egypt. He was not only a slave in Egypt, but he was also a soldier. When we see the first battles of the children of Israel, he's the guy out there fighting, fighting on the front line. He was also a servant to Moses. He was one of the 12 spies that went into the land one of only two that came back and said, we can get them. So now we're going to see tonight as we transition to chapter 2, uh, Joshua has been exhorting them and encouraging them and re reminding them of the faithfulness of God. And we saw responding to God's call last week, if you were here. We talked about our calling comes from the Lord, not from men. If you're waiting for a man to call you, you're going to wait the rest of your life. Because even if a man does call you, that's not the Lord. We want God to call us. Amen. And you know when someone's called by God because they do what they do as unto the Lord and they do it with excellence and it's a get to, not a have to. I get to lead worship. I get to serve in the children's ministry. You know, I get to, you know, put the words up so people can see them. I get to, whatever I'm doing, I get to do it for the Lord. I get to do the bulletins. It's a get to, not a have to. When the Lord calls you, He will walk with you. When God calls you, He doesn't leave you alone. When He calls you, often He's going to make you get outside of your comfort zone. And I think one of the biggest problems in the church today is we just want to be comfortable. We love the Lord, but sometimes not enough to be uncomfortable. And you hear me say it all the time, that God doesn't, you know, care about your comfort. He cares about your character. Amen? And he doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to get out of your comfort zone. What did he do with the apostles? Drop your nets and follow me. Leave everything you've ever known and ever done and come follow me. Where are we going? You'll find out when we get there. Just come follow me. That's the heart the Lord wants in us. We saw our calling is, is only fruitful if we are faithful. You can have a calling on your life and sit on your hands and miss out on God's highest. You can have a gift God's given you and just never use it, and you'll miss out. And then finally, when you're truly called by God, it will be obvious to others. You know, when Joshua was the man that God raised up, it didn't surprise anybody because he had been a faithful man all along. The, probably the most surprised was Joshua. I doubt that any, very few of the other people had any uh, concerns whatsoever because they saw the power of God upon his life. So now as we come to chapter 2, we have one of the most powerful example of God's love and his concern and his grace and it's compassion toward the individual. We're going to have this little snippet because remember how the last chapter ended. God told Joshua to take him into the land of promise. He went down from meeting. When he heard from the Lord, he went to the people and said, in three days, we're going in. He didn't say in three months or three years. He didn't say, I'm taking a vacation first. He said, the Lord said, we're going. Pack up your stuff. We're going in three days. And chapter two is what happens during those three days. And we're going to see that God has three million people wait so one prostitute could be ministered to. That's our God. Amen? He's a God of love and grace and compassion. While he ministers to the crowd, he cares about the individual. She's a pagan prostitute, and he's going to make three million people wait for three days so she can be spoken to. And we're going to see this woman. Her name is Rahab. And Rahab ends up in Hebrews chapter 11, which is God's hall of faith. There's only two women in that entire list. Sarah, right, Abraham's wife, and Rahab. The woman who's the bride of the father, father Abraham of all the Jewish people, and a pagan who ends up being the great-great-grandmother of King David. The Bible, God cares about the individual. Aren't you glad? 
Aren't you glad that he loves people unconditionally? And we're going to see that in tonight's text. We're going to see the incredible transforming power of God's grace, transforming the least likely of all people, again, a pagan prostitute, to a woman who, wor- a woman who had worshipped idols, who sold her body for money, into a woman of great faith. And I love when I see in the Bible people who struggle because it lets God, me know that God can use me. Can we say amen to that? Sometimes we feel disqualified, like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not. If, you, if everybody in the Bible was Daniel, we'd all just walk around defeated. You know, Daniel is one of the few people in the Old Testament without any recorded sin. We know he's a sinner, because all men are. But he was a godly man. But most of them, the Bible does not hide their frailties. And there's a reason behind that, because God doesn't use uh, great men. He takes flawed men and use them great, uses them greatly. So in the Old Testament, we see illustrations of New Testament truths, and we're going to see the compassion of God in tonight's text. Again, how God takes this woman, this most unlikely of women, and is going to use her in a mighty way. So if you've got your outline, grab it. I tell the message, from incredible sin to incredible faith. We know in Romans it says, but where sin abounded, grace abounds much more. Do you know that you cannot sin so much that you cannot be forgiven? Can we say amen to that? Did my uncle's funeral on Friday. And my aunt told me, you know, she, not, not that it would have changed anything anyway, but she told me as I was praying with the family before it started, she said, David, my, my, my aunt's known me since I was born. She said, we, want you to, we wanted you to do the funeral because we want you to go out there and give them Jesus and don't be shy about it. And I said, don't worry. <laughs> and, and you know what? You could see people squirming. And I even said, some of you right now, it's going to drive you crazy and you're going to be squirming in your seat. But guess what? Just because of your respect, respect for my uncle, you're going to sit there and listen. So guess what? I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And I'm going to tell you what my uncle would tell you if he was here right now. And we went through the gospel in a very bold way. Well, guess what? God's not shy about the truth, and he wants us to, to speak it with boldness. And the truth is that whether you're the most righteous person who ever lived, like Nicodemus, or the most ungodly woman in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, the answer is the same, you need Jesus. Whether you think you're religious and good, you need Jesus. Or you think you're so bad you can't be forgiven, you need Jesus. The answer is the same for everyone, it's Jesus. Amen. And so we're going to see in tonight's text that God's going to take a woman that seems beyond saving from the world's perspective, and he's going to use her in a mighty way. So we're going to talk about faith. She's going to go from incredible sin to incredible faith. And these are four ways we're going to see her faith. First, she's going to have courageous faith. What is courageous faith? Courageous faith is a faith that produces an action. I have faith. Okay, show me. You know, if we say we have faith, it's not really faith unless it produces that faith without works is dead. Amen? It's not faith or works or faith plus works. It's faith that works, that produces works. And courageous faith is a faith that steps out of your comfort zone and and goes to a place where you have to be desperate for God to be used by Him for for His kingdom and for His glory. So first we're going to see courageous faith as this woman that seems so unlikely to be used by God steps out in faith. And we're going to see confident faith. Guys, faith is only as strong as the one you put your faith in. I got an email today, and there's a a big speaker up in Santa Cruz, and I got some emails about him, and they're like, what do you think of this guy? And I went to his webpage, and all these Christian leaders are going to listen to this guy talk, and he needs to get saved is what needs to happen. It's a mess. He's got all these weird terminologies and theological words, and it's a bunch of nonsense. I go and look, and he's behind, believes in homosexual marriage. Nobody goes to hell. Um, he's, he basically, he preaches to millennials and tells them what they want to hear. And so I had a bunch of people say, Pat, should I go? I said, no, don't go. And as a matter of fact, if anybody knows, go and tell them not to go. Kidnap them. Don't let them go. This guy's a false prophet. He's a wolf. We don't want it. So guys, our faith is only as strong as the one we put our faith in. It's not faith in faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's faith in the Lord. And our faith can be great because our God is great. And a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So we're going to see courageous faith. Then we're going to see confident faith. That we can trust God. That we don't walk around in doubt all the time and in anguish and in fear and in worry. We have confidence not because of our ability, but because of who we follow. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. Amen? 
I haven't shared this with anybody. I had a, a little glitch this week. Um, a couple days ago, I could not see. I was, my vision was so blurry, and I had, a, I had really bad headaches, and I called the 800 number, and they were worried I might have a brain tumor. I'm like, oh, man, you might, that's not, that sounds like it could be a brain. You might want to come down here and get an x-ray. Okay. You know what? I'll be honest with you. I was thinking, I could see my dad in a couple weeks. That'd be sweet. I mean, seriously. You know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen? And good news is there's nothing. It was just headaches and blurred vision, maybe because I had elevated blood pressure or whatever. But, you know, the reality is that Christians, we can have confident faith. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried. We don't have to be anxious. You know who's anxious? People who don't know what happens after this life. You know who's worried? People who don't know who's in control. And we're going to see this woman who just has gotten to know God. She's known him a brief amount of time. And she's already having courageous, not only courageous faith, but confident faith. She basically says what the ten spies didn't believe. Well, we know you're God's God. And we know he's in control. And we can trust him. Number three, concerned faith. Concerned faith means that if you truly have faith, you're going to have a burden for the lost. My wife used to tell me sometimes, she'd say, babe, you know, sometimes you get after people too much to be sharing their faith. Like, you act like if they're not sharing their faith, they're not saved. And I, if you're not sharing your faith, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not in the center of God's will. Amen? Amen. You can be saved and keep your faith to yourself, but I'm not sure how. Because the reality is, it's the most selfish thing we can do is go to heaven by ourselves. Amen? I, oh, I got to get out of hell free car. Let me put it in my wallet and, and let everybody else too bad for you. You know, I get out of the burning building. I uh, hope, they, hope they get out and just go, you know, I'm going to go swimming. You know, if we just leave and we don't care, we're going to see that this woman, Rahab, is going to have a concerned faith. She's going to say, what about my family? And I love that heart. And then finally, we're going to see covenant faith, a faith based on unbreakable promises. We see God making covenants with people throughout the, throughout the word. With Abraham, it was circumcision, a reminder of God's promise to Abraham and Abraham's commitment to God. We saw it with Noah. What was the, what was the thing that was the commitment? Had, what was the sign that God gave Noah? The rainbow. It's on your notes if you're reading them. It's right there. <laughs> Jesus, right? The Lord's Supper. As often you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And we're going to see with Rahab tonight in the scarlet cord. So let's begin there in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 2. By the way, Jesus is in every chapter. We always talk about this. And man, is he in the chapter tonight. And at the very end of the text, I'm going to show you some things that God showed me in this chapter. And man, it's such good stuff. Let's begin there in verse 1. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia, from Acacia Grove, to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of the harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So God tells, moving on Joshua's heart, he tells the people, we're going to leave in three days. And during those three days, he sends two men into the land. And they're secret spies, not really as much that they're secrets to the people in the land, because of course they're secret spies to them. That's always the case. You're not a spy if it's not secret. You're a tourist or something, right? But it's a secret from the children of Israel. They don't even know that they went. And these two spies go out. Now, it's interesting. Last time they sent 12 spies. How many came back with a good report? Two. I'm just sending two this time. Right? We're just going to send out two, and we're going to know that God's going to speak to these two. And we don't know in Scripture who the two were. Uh, Jewish tradition says, and it's tradition, so we don't know. It would make sense that it was Caleb and Eliezer, the high priest. And that would make sense. Because who was one of the two that went last time and came back with a good report? Caleb. Caleb. And the high priest going with them. So it makes sense that that's who they were. But whoever they were, they were going to go into the land. And he tells them to go and spy out the biggest fortress in all of the land of promise, Jericho. It's right, it's right in the center of the land. There's an equal amount south of it and north of it. And he says, I want you to go in, and that's the first place we're going to attack. And we're going to divide this place, and then we're going to destroy everything to the south, and then everything to the north, and I want you to go to Jericho. Can you imagine, though, again, if you just look at it from a physical perspective, these two men go into Jericho, and what do they see? They see a walled city. 
I've been to the ruins of where Jericho was, and Jericho uh, had a wall around it that was, it wasn't just one wall, it was basically two walls in a sense, because there was a wall and then 15 feet built up and then on the other side of the wall. They could run chariots side by side on the top of this wall going around it. So they had chariots, they had weapons, they had a mighty fortress. Did the children of Israel have any weapons? Our Bible doesn't say they do. If they had weapons, I don't think they'd be blowing trumpets a few chapters from now, but that's what they're going to be doing. Uh, do they have, do they have, they don't have chariots, they don't have weapons, they don't have a fortress. You know what they have? God. And guys, too often for us, we'll look at our circumstances. Oh, look what's going on in my law. My finances are a mess. You know, look at my, you go out of a brain tumor. Who knows what's going on in your life? And oh man, my kids are going sideways and I've got issues with family members or whatever it is. And we can get overwhelmed and we only get overwhelmed if we forget who's in control. Amen? Is God as much in control when everything is a mess as he was when everything was perfect in your life? He's in control. Trust him. He's a faithful God. Joshua chapter 1, he said, For within three days you will cross over this Jordan and go in and possess the land which the Lord has given you. So why after 40 years, three more days? Because there was a divine appointment waiting on the other side. So secretly they went in, the two sent out by Joshua, not to figure if they were to go in, God had already commanded them to go, but to view the land and to gain information about the enemy. They weren't going to figure out if they were going to go in the land. We already know they're going. He already told them, we're leaving in three days. But he sends them in to spy out the land in a sense, but what he's really doing, and they don't even know it. I think the men go in thinking they're going to spy out the land. And what God does is he brings them a divine appointment. And too often, we think we're going to do something for God, and God has something else in mind. Amen. I told you about my son-in-law going and planting a church in Boulder, and then a church in Broomfield. Fifteen minutes away, the pastor leaves, and now he's pastoring a church in a city he didn't even plan on going to, to with a bunch of people he never thought. He, and now he's pastoring both churches, but he went to go to Boulder. And when you step out in faith, sometimes God has, does exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. Amen? That you would think, what, what, what could it be? So he sends them out, and God's promises shouldn't lull us into complacency. God had already told them they're going to the land, they're going to have victory. But notice, they didn't sit on their hands and wait for God to do it all. They were being faithful to God's calling. Joshua knew that they were going to win. Joshua knew the victory was theirs, but Joshua still sent them in into the land. Why? Because just because God made promises to us doesn't mean that we don't participate, that we're not faithful in those promises. Amen? So they step out. And Jericho, a, stra a strategic city again, in Joshua's plan to conquer Canaan. Again, of great fortified cities, just five miles west of the Jordan River, the strongest fortress and the most important city in all of Can Canaan. And again, often as we step out in faith, we don't know what God has for us. It says there, and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Many have struggled with two godly men spending the night at a prostitute's house. I don't recommend that. Amen? Don't do that. That's a bad idea. And you look at this, and some have tried to explain it away because you can use the word uh, harlot some have tried to change the meaning to a variation of the word that she was an innkeeper. Try to change it to innkeeper. Guess what? Read the whole Bible. Because in Hebrew, the word harlot means harlot. And in Greek, we're going to see in the New Testament, uh, the Greek word that's used is a prostitute, a harlot. She was a prostitute. So this woman was not only pagan, she was not only an idol worshiper, she was a prostitute. She sold her money, her body for money. You know, even in a pagan land, that's the most looked down upon person there. So even amongst idol worshipers, she's looked down upon by idol worshipers. But there's going to be a divine appointment. The real reason these spies being sent out was to go and to meet this woman. Not to gain military ex uh, experience, but as an example of God's love, concern, and compassion for the individual was to deliver Rahab from God's coming judgment. Doesn't the Lord always give an opportunity for the righteous to escape? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? I'll save it. You got, show me ten righteous. I'll save the place. But he gave the people who truly loved him an opportunity, a picture of the rapture. 
So why did godly men stay in a harlot's house? It could have been anonymity, regardless of the man's reasoning. It was God's plan. It was a divine appointment. Just as Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners, these two men thought they were spies about to become witnesses. It's true for us. You might think you're a teacher or a construction worker, or an Uber driver or a salesman or, you know, whatever it might be, an IT guy. And the reality is that you're a witness wherever you go. You're a witness who happens to sell advertising like either. You're a witness who happens to, to be an accountant or whatever your job is, a teacher. But when you go there, the first thing you are is you're salt and light of that place. And as these men go in as spies, what they really are, are witnesses. I love this picture as God's got a divine appointment waiting for them. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've walked by divine appointments. How about you? My prayer is daily, Lord, let me not miss them. They're the first ones into the land. They're the first ones to experience the purpose of God's power. And again, it wasn't for personal experience, but for boldness, because they were witnesses moved into the land of promise. And guys, when you and I witness, we're being faithful to God's promise. Verse 2 and 3. As it as says there, as it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. So word had gone out that these spies had come into the land. And so the king says, Oh, we got to find those spies. And somehow somebody told that they saw some strange men at Rahab's house, which I don't think was a, something you know, unusual. She's a prostitute. But they bring Rahab in for questioning. Where are these men? Now for Rahab, there's a choice here to make. One, if she turns the men in, she probably is going to get a reward. She's probably going to be paid to do it. You know, if you turn over people who are spying on the land and seeking to destroy your country, uh, you know, you're, they might throw a parade in your honor. The other option is to not turn them in and risk her own death. So I can be a hero or a fugitive. I can be paid handsomely to do what the world wants me to do, or I can honor God and the consequences may be heavy. There's the choice. You know what? We, got, we have that choice all the time. Can we say amen to that? We have opportunities to go out and do the ungodly and maybe profit from it, but we all know that won't profit long. Or we can step up and stand up for God knowing we could lose our job, knowing we could, you know, face uh, the, the fallout of making a stand for the Lord. And so here's Rahab. And she knows of God. We're going to see in a few verses. You know what she knows about God? She heard about all the things the God of Israel had done. We're going to see that she knows about the Red Sea that happened 40 years earlier. That she knows about the battles they had fought and they had won. And so the people had heard about the power of God. And this, the amazing part to me is Rahab's going to have more faith than the 10 spies who went through the Red Sea, who came into the land and said, we can't have victory. She heard about it and had more faith than people that experienced it. This is courageous faith. She had found out, been found out. She had been put to death as a traitor. So how is Rahab going to react? It's one thing to receive words of these witnesses. It's another thing to take these words and have them impact your actions, have them put feet to your faith. It's the one thing to say we believe in God. It's another thing to walk it out. It's, another, it's one thing to say that I'm going to live my life sold out for the Lord. It's another thing to do it. Faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Look at verse 4 and 5 says there, then, all, then the woman took the two men and hid them. And she said, yes, the men did come to see me, but I did not know where they were from. Is that true? Is she lying? She's lying. Verse 5, and it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. When the men went where they went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. If she's just lying through her teeth, what's the answer? Is this okay? Is it okay for us to lie in certain circumstances? No. 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 Thou shalt not lie, unless you're being threatened, then it's okay. 
Is that what the verse says? You know what it is? Now, look, she's just beginning to understand who God is. And, you know, Abraham, the father of faith, lied. She's my sister. Amen? And not once, but twice. She's my sister. Lied. Isaac lied, got over on, remember, he got over on his dad. Oh, yeah, I'm Esau. No, you're not. But he lied. We see this. Lying takes place. It doesn't mean it's okay. And I've heard people say, well, it's okay to lie, you know, in certain circumstances. I think lying is a lack of faith. Amen? Yeah, they were here. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I was hiding them from you guys. How about that? Guys, if we trust in the sovereignty of God, you're indestructible to God's through with you. Amen? You don't have to change the word of God. You don't, oh, because here's what happens. That's a slippery slope. Now we just tell people what they want to hear. So, because, oh, let's just not offend them. So let's just change the gospel. So let's tell them what they want to hear. Guys, let's speak the truth in love. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we tell the truth, we're being Christ-like. And we tell a lie, he's the father of lies, we're being Satan-like. Amen? And there's no such thing as a half-truth. A half-truth is a whole lie. Amen? So here's the picture of what's happening. If she gets confronted and she lies. Now again, some would say, well, she doesn't even understand the whole truth yet. On one hand, she demonstrated her faith in the Lord by protecting the spies. On the other hand, she acted like any pagan in the city when she lied about her guest. And again, while a brand new believer, in a sense, we could blame her actions on her ignorance, but it's not an excuse and it does not justify sin. If seasoned believers like Abraham, Isaac, and David resorted to deception, what did, remember David lied to Bathsheba's husband. Remember? Brought him home put him out on the front line, basically murdered him. Godly people do it, it's still wrong. So her lies are not justified, but in one sense, it does show that she has a level of courage. I remember uh, on one of my trips to India, um, some of you know I used to go to India every year and I used to teach up to a thousand pastors how to study and teach the Bible. And I can't think of anything I've done with two weeks of my life more profitable than giving the ability for these pastors to study and teach the Bible and then study and teach it for the rest of their lives. They don't have commentaries. They have a Bible, so I teach inductive Bible study. Well, I was there during a convergence that doesn't happen very often. I don't know how often, but I think it's every you know, 40, 50 years where Diwali, the high Hindu holiday, and Ramadan, the high Muslim holiday, happen at the same time. And the nation's about half Muslim and about half Hindi, Hindu. And so I was told by the people when I was there, don't tell anybody you're a Christian, whatever you do. Don't tell them you're a Christian because they, they're all whipped up. And the Hindus were blowing off fireworks and stuff and the Ramadan they having all their prayer. And he said, you're going to be in the middle of that. And all the people out there hate you from both sides. So first of all, you're going to stand like a sore thumb because you're a white guy. And second of all, if you say you're a Christian, it's not going to end well. So I'm walking from the place I taught back to the hotel where I was staying, and they're selling all their Indian, their Hindu gods on tables in different shapes and sizes, and people see you, and it's obvious you're not from around here, and people start asking me, what are you doing here? They said, well, tell them you're a tourist. So the, guy, the first guy that asked me, and I had another pastor with me from Calvary Chapel in Oregon, he just didn't say anything, he kept walking. He didn't want to lie. And finally, the guy followed me. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a born-again Christian, and I came here to teach people how to study and teach the Bible so they can stay here and teach you and bring the truth of Christianity to this land that so desperately needs Jesus. That's why I'm here. I figured, can't threaten me with heaven. Amen? Because I'm not going to, you know what, can you imagine? I'm not going to lie about Jesus. There's no way. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of fear. It's not going to happen. And so, you know what? By the grace of God, I was protected. They were all mad at me. I get back to the hotel. I can't believe you did that. I said, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to do it every time I get asked. Confess me before men, and I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. I'm not going to lie. I'm not doing it. I refuse. 
And I don't, and you know, guys, but you know what? You know, it's, sometimes it's easier to do it in India with the threat of death than to tell your next door neighbor. Amen? I live next to those Indians. I'm not going to see them. If they kill me, I'll be dead anyway. I'll be in heaven. But i got to live next to that guy. And there's this mentality. So Rahab, you know, she has a level of courage in that she stands up for it, but she lies. That's, it's not acceptable. Don't, don't let people use that verse to make you think that it's okay. But she tells them that they've left and they've run out. Go catch them. Verse 6. It says there, but she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So she takes them up onto the rooftop where they easily could have been found, and she has stacks of flax, you know, it's a grain, and it's all stacked together, and they're hiding within the stacks. So she's harboring fugitives. If she gets found out, she's going to die. And even though she's, she does show a level of courage that she's willing to be put to death if necessary, she's not going to let them know where these men are. Now, flax, just keep in mind for later in the chapter, out of flax they would make rope, and linen, and thread. So just keep that in mind for later on the text. Rope, linen, and thread. So the men heeding uh, Rahab's words went out after the, the two spies, and they went a great distance away, uh, and again, didn't go over as to not expose them to Israel's army going over the Jordan. So instead what they did is they went in the op- she sent them in the opposite direction, and that's where they went looking for the men. They, they went toward where the children of Israel were, but they didn't go all the way there. And so she's going to tell these men in a moment to go out and go hide up in the hills. And as soon as these men return, then you can go back to your people. So she comes up with this plan. So the first thing we see is courageous faith, putting feet to her faith. She didn't just believe it. She literally laid down her life potentially. Don't necessarily agree with all of her tactics, but she was willing to be seen as a traitor to lose her own life if necessary. This is someone who truly believes that these two men are coming back and that they're going to have victory. She wants to be, she trusts in their, in what's going to happen and she believes in them. Now look what's the second thing we're going to see is confident faith. Look what happens here in verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land. The terror of you has fallen on us. And all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. So everybody in Jericho, with the chariots and the weapons and the fortress, are scared of a bunch of people wandering in the wilderness. Why? Red Sea parted. Manna fell from the sky. Plagues upon Egypt. Sion and Og, the armies they had just fought and wiped out on the other side of the Jordan. The word had gotten to the people of Jericho, and they were like, dude, whoever their God is, he's God. And it says that terror came upon them. They were fearful. They were afraid. So they had a greater belief in the God of Israel than those ten spies who came 40 years earlier and ran away afraid. The people in the fortress were petrified. The word faint-hearted literally means that their hearts melted. They were so afraid that their hearts melted. They were were broken hearted. They were like, oh, we're in trouble. They didn't say, who are these little pipsqueaks coming? They didn't see the weakness of men. They saw the greatness of their God. And guys, sometimes the world will recognize the greatness of our God even greater than some Christians, unfortunately. And so they were fearful. The people were in dread and fear and horror of Israel's rumored invasion because their weapons and their chariots were no match for the greatness of God. Again, faint-hearted means to melt like wax before a fire. So here's this mighty army, mighty fortress, the greatest people in the land. Just as Moses predicted in Exodus 15, all the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away and fear and dread will come upon them. It's being fulfilled right here in these verses we just read. 
He told them, when you get there, they're all going to be afraid. They're going to be scared to death. When you walk into the land, they're going to be in terror. Their hearts are going to melt away because the power of the God that walks before you. Look at verse 10. For we heard how the Lord dried up the water in the Red Sea. For when you came out of Egypt, when did that happen? How, how many years before this? 40 years. They knew what happened 40 years ago and had not forgotten it. We heard you walked across the sea on dry land. And then all Pharaoh's people did a dead man float. Amen? We, we know, we, 40 years ago, they remembered. The children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness for not very long, and they wanted to go back to Egypt. We had leeks and onions back there. So they forgot, but the enemy remembered. So we remember that you crossed on the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So they remembered what happened 40 years ago, and they remembered what had just happened a few months earlier, and the reports of the Lord's power had traveled to Canaan, and they were scared to death. Just as God's word predicted that they would be afraid. In Deuteronomy 2, it says, This day... I will begin to put dread and fear of you upon the nations under all of heaven, and shall hear, they shall hear report of you, and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. You know that God, when, when nations I believe today still that honor God, the people have fear of them. Every country in the Middle East hates Israel. They all hate them. They all want them wiped off the face of the earth. And you know what else? They'll never admit it. They're all scared to death of them. And they ought to be. Amen? Because if God is for them, who can be against them? And those are God's chosen people. And you read the end of the book, God wins. Amen? And Israel's not going anywhere. And God is greater than all the enemies that surround them. The Bible tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Look at verse 11. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did we remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Rahab's preaching it. Amen. Your God is God, by the way, and he's the God of heaven, he's the God of earth. Man, he's God. We're all scared to death because God's on your side, and our weapons are nothing compared to your God, the true and living God. It's pretty scary when the enemy has a greater respect for God than those who are supposed to be following him. There's not a doubt in my mind that Satan fears God more than I have faith in God. Can we say amen to that? I want my faith to increase, but there's not a doubt in my mind. Satan's seen him. He knows. He's toast. Amen? He knows. Game over. He knows he loses. He knows. He knows how great God is. Remember, every time they cast out demons, right, in the name of Jesus, man, they would, you know, remember Acts 19, uh, you know, uh, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? The guy tries to cast out the demons, right? Everybody, they know who the Lord is, and they're fearful of Him. And here they are, they're just, the whole country, they're melting like wax. They're fearful, and they're afraid of the true and living God. It's amazing to me that she was courageous before the king, and she's confident of who God is. We need Christians to be like that. Amen? Courageous before the world, and confident of who God is. There's not a doubt in my mind who my God is. How about you? Not a doubt. I know it. Oh, you can't know for sure. Yes, you can. And I do. How many of you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven? Amen? It's not a hope so, it's a no so. Not because we're good, but because he's great and he's faithful to his promises. And we can trust in that. And it brings peace to our hearts. She's courageous. And again, she's confident in who God really is. She didn't, you know, she didn't talk about any of those pagan idols. All of a sudden, they're not such a big deal. All those big idols, all those statues we got over town, I mean, nothing. We're not even praying to them. It's not working. Your God's greater. We already know. Our, our idols haven't, killed, haven't wiped out lands. Our idols didn't part any Red Seas. Our idols didn't do any of this. You serve the true and living God. She'd come to believe in one God, not many. 
that he was a personal God who would work on behalf of those who trusted him, that he had given the land to Israel, and that he was the God of heaven and of earth, all nations, not just one. And look at the confidence of this woman who's just been exposed to some level, but was grown up in a pagan land, was a prostitute. Her life was such a mess, and look how quickly God just gets a hold of her heart. What a picture. Our confidence as God's children comes from the witness of, God, of the Word of God before us and the witness of the Spirit of God within us. You know why I have confidence? Why we should all have confidence? Is the Word of God before me and the Spirit of God inside of me. Amen? Got nothing to be afraid of. You can't threaten us with heaven. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Rahab's conversion was an act of God's grace. She was condemned to be destroyed, a Gentile, a pagan, a prostitute. She didn't deserve salvation, and yet God's going to deliver her nonetheless. Guess what? None of us deserve salvation. And Jesus delivered us nonetheless. So from incredible sin to incredible faith. We saw courageous faith and confident faith and now concerned faith. And I love this. I love her heart here. Look what it says in verse 12. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord... Since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Notice she doesn't mention a husband or children. Prostitutes don't typically have husbands or children. But she still has people she cares about. And so she begins to intercede. She just has finally understood the truth. Does, how long has she grasped it? Not very long, but she's already understands it's enough to say, they're coming back, and they're going to level this place, and I want to be on your side. And when you come back, could you spare my family, please? She's not just looking out for herself, but she's burdened for those that she loves, that they would be saved too. Should that not be the heart of every believer? That we would be burdened for everyone that we know and love, and even those we don't know, that they would come to know Christ. The best part about my uncle's funeral is that, I may have shared this already, but you know, he was a CEO Christian. You know what that is, right? Christmas and Easter only, right? CEO. And so he would go to church a couple times a year, Whenever he came up to the city, wherever city I was in, he would always come to churches I pastored. And he was always very encouraging to me and was always telling me how, you know, he appreciates the gift God's given me. And he was always very encouraging that way as an uncle. But he was never really plugged in. And most of the time when his family would go to church, he'd go on a bike ride. Or he'd, he used to run triathlons. And he was just a, a health freak, play racquetball, stuff like that. And I was really concerned because when I got, was asked to go do his funeral, I love my uncle. From the world's perspective, he was the nicest man you'd ever meet. Always a smile on his face. I never heard him, you know, just always happy, contented, just a great guy. But when my niece did the eulogy portion, she said, you know, she started talking about when they moved to Georgia. A couple years ago, her family moved to Georgia. She's their only daughter, so they picked up and moved to Georgia to be with their daughter and grandkids. But while they were in Georgia, my uncle found a church started going, got plugged in, started going to Sunday school, started going to men's Bible study, started going to the married couples Bible study, and his favorite time every week was Sunday morning at church, and he couldn't wait for it, couldn't get enough of it, and God got a hold of his life. And when she shared that, I was in tears, because I was just saying, thank you, Jesus. Because I've been praying for my uncle for as long as I can remember, because you know what? I want him to be there. Amen? Amen? I want him to be there. When I did my grandmother's funeral, his mom's funeral, I was preaching at heart, and I had one person in mind in that whole audience. It was my uncle. And I'm so glad I'm going to see him again. This is Rahab's heart. Hey, when you come in and wipe everybody out, because I know you're going to, because your God's greater than all of our idols, and our fortress is going to be toast when you get here. And, and you know what? Our army means nothing, because your God's greater. Sion and all got smoked. We're next. Hey, can you, can you do me a favor and take care of my family, please? When you come back, could you protect them? That's a concerned faith, a heart for others, not satisfied just that we're going to heaven. You know, it's interesting that 
she was really needing to be quiet or she might lose her life. And yet she spoke up. And God tells us to speak up and we keep quiet. Can we say amen to that? God tells us, go tell everybody. Go to all the world and preach the gospel. You know, make disciples of all nations, baptize them. Go, speak. Don't be shy about it. And then most of us are shy about it. And she's not supposed to be talking about it, and she can't stop talking about it. Praise God for that. Amen? Verse 14, as we finish up this little section on concerned faith. So the men answered her, our lives for yours. If none of you tell, none of you tell, this business of ours, it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. This is a solemn pledge between the spies who represent Israel, who represent God, and this pagan prostitute who says, she said, if you, if you will protect us, if the word doesn't get out, if you protect the truth from, from the people around you, if you protect us, then we will protect you. And it's, it's the same as the, you know, the covenants with God. It's if then. If we obey, then we'll be blessed. Amen? If we confess our sin, we'll be saved. Amen? While God does all the work, we need to respond, right? We need to respond in faith. If then, if then. Throughout Scripture, you see that. It's, it's a conditional covenant. If you will obey, if you will repent, if you will confess me, right? Then you go to heaven. And so this is the covenant they enter into with Rahab. And again, for Rahab, she needed to be quiet, and then her family would all be saved. So courageous faith, then confident faith, then concerned faith, and finally, covenant faith. It says there, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. So she literally, the wall was big enough, they had apartments in a sense, right, in the wall. And so you, you know, inside the wall, as it went up and down, you know, you would be inside the wall, there's your apartment, and she has a window outside there. And so she lowers these guys down using a rope. I wonder where she got the rope. The flax on the, on the top, right, amen? That's where they make rope from. She makes her rope, and she's lowering these guys down the side of the wall. Again, if, can you imagine if a guard came by and saw them hanging there? Everybody's dying. But she did it anyway because she had put her faith in God. A covenant is simply an agreement between two or more parties with certain conditions laid down before both sides that both sides must obey. And this is the, the spies, the witnesses, let uh, again down by a rope, hid for three days in the mountains just behind Jericho in the opposite direction of the town. Look at verse 16, it says there, it says that she dwelt in the wall and said to them, go to the mountain, let the pursuers meet you, let, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So they went in this direction to find them. She sent them in this direction. I've been to the, where Jericho was, and when you go there, you see there's mountains right behind it. So they went up into those hills and waited till the men came back, having looked for them, and then they went back in safety. So she not only sent them down, but she protected them. She was a part of their plan, and here she is putting her life at risk to do so. Here's, she's made a promise to them, and she's being faithful to it. Verse 17 and 18. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your home. Here's what they say. Look, we made a promise to you. We'll protect you, but you need to have this rope. You need to make a rope, scarlet cord, so a red rope, hanging out of the window, and anybody you want to be saved has to be in your house. And if they're outside of the house and they get killed, that's not our fault, that's your fault. 
We're going to be faithful to our covenant that when we come, if you have the red cord hanging out your window, you and everyone in your house will command the armies to protect you and will make sure that you are delivered to freedom. Now, what's interesting about this, I was going to share it at the end, do you think it's scarlet for a reason? What is that a picture of? The blood of Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. You know, you heard of red light districts, right? You know, the prostitutes would paint their windows red. So everybody would know they were prostitutes, open for business. What's interesting is they paint the window red and there's a rope hanging out. And when you look up at this window, they were slats this direction. So you got a red window like this and you got a rope hanging out of it. And you see it from a distance. What does that look like? It's the cross. Now, isn't it interesting that the same thing happened when they were delivered out of bondage in Egypt, right? At Passover, the blood of the lamb in the shape of a cross, and everyone inside the home was delivered. The same thing's happening here in Jericho. The blood, picture the blood, in the shape of a cross, and everyone inside the house is delivered. If they, if they did not stay under the blood, they did not have the promise. If those did not stay in the house under the blood when they were delivered out of bondage in Egypt, the firstborn died. If she stayed under the picture of the... Now, she had no way of knowing that was a picture of a cross. And they didn't even understand the cross when they put the blood of the lamb in Egypt. What they did is simply obey what God commanded them to do, even when they didn't understand. Isn't that a good word for all of us? I don't understand why God's doing it this way. We don't have to. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God's a lot smarter than you? I am. I'm an idiot compared to God. We're all idiots compared to God. Amen? So if God understands, I don't need to understand. I just need to trust Him. So she's got a clear command, and she needs to be faithful to it. And if she will be faithful, then they will be delivered. I love that picture. So the covenant which Rahab and her family was conditioned upon her placing a scarlet cord out her window, and it would serve as a signal to the army of Israel that the people within were to be spared. And despite Rahab's desire, despite her faith and the promises of the spies, she and those in her family would perish unless she put the trust in the blood red cord cast down from her window. So it didn't matter what promises she made. It didn't matter what good work she had done. If she did not put the red cord out the window without the picture of the cross, she would die. So it doesn't matter how good we've been. It doesn't matter what promises we've made. It doesn't matter what good works we've done. Apart from the cross of Calvary, we're going to die in our sin. Can you say amen to that? Well, I've done all these good works, and that's how the world operates. Well, I give to charity, and, you know, I, 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 you know, I let people in in traffic. I'm a good person. So I'm sure I'll be fine if there's a God. No, we're all sinners, and that's why Jesus had to die. Without the scarlet cord, she would not be saved. And again, now that cord made ropes. It made, uh, a li- it made line. It made thread. It made linen, and it made thread. And no doubt all made from the same dry flax. Look at verse 19. So it shall be, whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we will be guiltless, and whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid upon him. So the refuge again was only available to those within the house where the scarlet cord was hanging out the window. And again, often in biblical covenants, God appointed some physical or material token to remind the people of what God had promised. Circumcision reminded the children of Israel for generations of their covenant with God. It was also a reminder to the man's wife when they got married that he had made his covenant to God. It was a constant reminder. The rainbow Does it not just make you sick to your stomach what the enemies try to do with the rainbow? Because when you see a rainbow, people don't think God's promised. They think you're a homosexual. Is that not true? If you have a rainbow pencil, a rainbow necklace, a rainbow anything. And you know what? Satan's trying to, what God uses a, a redemption promise being delivered from the flood to be used to symbolize one of the very reasons that the flood came. 
Why did the flood come? Because everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, and they were godless, and they had rejected God, and they turned themselves over to fleshly desires, and now they're taking that same symbol and trying to use it. Tragic. We need to get the rainbow back. What do you say? We need to redeem it. It's what it really means. Same is true of the Lord's Supper. Now here, this scarlet thorn. So, uh, cord. So Rahab's family saved by faith in God, not the cord. Their faith wasn't in the cord. Their faith was in God. But they did what God asked them to do. Amen. They were. They had been worshiping idols. Now they're putting their faith in God and obeying what God asked them to do. So too today, we're saved not by circumcision, not by baptism, not by communion, but our faith in Christ. Amen. Should we be baptized? What's the answer? Yes. Do we need to be baptized to be saved? Why? Because Jesus said it's finished. Let me encourage you, though. I'll say this as strong as I can say it. If you're a believer and you haven't been baptized, you need to be. Amen? It's an outward statement of an inward change. Well, I've just never gotten around to it. Then get around to it. Matter of fact, I've got a jacuzzi in my backyard. You can come over to my house tomorrow. You know, we do baptisms two or three times a year down at the beach in Malibu. I want to encourage you to be baptized. Yes. It's cool in that water down there. Amen. It should be in Santa Cruz. You'd be saying that's a jacuzzi out there. Verse 20. And if you tell the business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. The oath was only good if Rahab kept her word. If you, if you lie, if you back away, if you don't honor it, then it's of no value. And the same is true with the cross. People say, why would God send good people to hell? How many, how many times have you been asked that question? Why would God send good people to hell? First of all, there are no good people. Let's just fix that. There's none righteous, no, not one. Amen? The better question is, why would God allow evil people to go to heaven? Well... It can only happen through what Jesus did on the cross because when we are born again, we're washed in the blood of the Lamb and He makes us holy. Amen? So salvation is offered universally, but it must be accepted individually. We have to accept it. He won't force it on you. Good works won't get you there, but it's offered universally. So what have you done with God's Son? It's not enough to say you believe. But again, if you make a profession, but you don't, really mean it in your heart. If Rahab had just been saying this and getting over on them, and as soon as they, you know, ran to the hills, she ran and told everybody, they're actually up in the hills, go kill them. Then her family would have died with everyone else. But she had to be faithful to her word and faithful to the covenant. And guys, God's called us to be faithful to the commitment we've made to him. By the way, we can't do it without his help. Can we say amen to that? Lord, I need your help. We're almost done. Verse 21. Then she said, according to your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now, I love this. How quickly did she put that cord out the window? She knows when I come back for a few days. She didn't say, well, you know, I think I'll have a picnic today, and then I'll go hang out with some people, and maybe, you know, in a few days. I'll... Dude, they're walking out. She's putting that cord out the window. Guys, I think too often with Christians, we hesitate in what we commit to God that we're going to do. One of the things I always loved about Moses, God would say it, Moses would do it. God would say it, Moses would do it. Go tell the people, and he told the people. Joshua, take him into land. He comes down, you got three days. Get your stuff together, we're going. And guys, I think too often what you know, Satan's biggest lies are, if he can't get you to believe in no heaven, if he can't get you to believe in no heaven, the next biggest lie he'll tell you is no hurry. Well, I can't get him not to believe in heaven. I'll just make him think they've got forever to sit around and eventually get to serve in God, and I'll just render them useless for the kingdom. If he can't take you to hell with him, he wants to make you uh, ineffective for heaven. And there needs to be a sense of urgency. Amen? Urgency is a good thing. You know, a, a potential brain tumor scare every once in a while is a good thing. Being in the hospital for nine months, good thing. You're reminded, you might be dying tomorrow. What are you going to do with the 24 hours you got left? Be about it. Amen? God is faithful. Last four, three verses, look what happens. 
They departed and went to the mountain and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers sought, the pursuers sought them all along the way, but they did not find them. Do you, know, you do know that our God is greater than any enemy, and the enemy can't touch us unless God allows it. Can we say amen to that? We're going through Acts. The Apostle Paul, he's getting beaten everywhere he goes. They can't kill him. They did kill him, and God just said, well, just get back up. Amen? We're indestructible until God's through with us. And here they, they go out, and God protects them. God watches over them. They couldn't find them. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and crossed over, and they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that had been befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered us in all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. The spies come back and testify what they have seen, and truly the Lord has delivered the land into our hands. Almost a direct quote from Rahab. It was almost like, the Ra it's like Rahab taught the spies. Rahab said, Dude, we're all, we're all melting over here. We're all scared to death, and we know your God is God. And you're going to come in here and just wipe us out. And they go back and say, they're all scared to death. They're afraid in there. Their hearts are melting in there. And we're going to go in and wipe them out. Isn't it amazing that this woman, who was seemingly as far from salvation as anyone, became a mighty woman of God, and her deliverance is a picture, in a sense, of Gentile Passover. Right? Put the blood of the lamb, this picture, right, out your window. Just like they marked their windows and doors, she marks her window with the, the, the red, right, the blood, picture of the blood of the cross that she doesn't even understand. But she's being obedient to it. And she's honoring the Lord. And I love this picture of Rahab. The sign of a harlot on a windowsill, like a red light district, now with something that was used to help form a cross. Don't you love how God redeems sinful stuff? Amen? The thing that was a blight to her now became a source of, picture of salvation. The same image that delivered the Israelites at Passover now delivers her. Now, they had pagan idolatry in Jericho, but they had pagan idolatry in Egypt. And God delivered them both in the, with a similar method, again, through the blood. Now, the rope... And flax, same thing that covered the spies. Uh, priestly garments were made from the same uh, source. So the rope that lowered down the spies and the rope that redeemed the harlot is that same material they used to make the linen of the high priest. And I don't think it's by chance that the same thing that covered the high priest is the same thing that lowered the, the spies down and the same thing that was the sign of the woman's commitment and covenant to God. Because guys, we're all saved the same way, whether we're a spy in the land working for God or we're a pagan prostitute or we're uh, you know, the children of Israel or the high priest, we're all saved the same way. Amen? We all need Jesus just as much. Nicodemus needed Jesus just as much as the woman at the well. The Pope of the day, the ruler of the people, you must be born again. And the woman who went out in the middle of the heat, didn't want to be seen by other people, even the pagans looked down upon her, the answer is the same. And that same material, that same flax that was on the rooftop, was the same material that they used to make the priestly garments, the same material they used to lower spies to their freedom, and the same material that made the cross in the home window of a prostitute. Guys, it's all the cross. It all points to Jesus. The Bible rocks. Amen? Is Jesus in this chapter or what? Don't we see the scarlet cord? Don't we see a picture of his blood upon the cross of Calvary? I just love the Bible. It's so good. So whether a high priest or a prostitute, the covering is the same. No matter what your background, you must be born again. Now robed in righteousness of Christ, hidden by his righteousness. Rahab, this prostitute, this dramatic conversion. She now fears God. She knows about God. She has faith in God. She makes public profession. Your God is God. She has personal conviction. She hung the cord out the window. As my dad would say, she got saved real good. Amen? Amen? Radical transformation. What about the change? She responded to God's great grace with great faith. So in closing, 
from incredible sin to incredible faith. First, we saw courageous faith. It's a faith that produces an action. It's not just saying we believe in, you know, and by the way, it's not faith in faith, it's faith in Christ. Amen? Amen? I've got faith. Faith in what? In myself. Good luck. <laughs> faith in Christ. Amen? But not only courageous faith, but confident faith. Again, faith is only as strong as the one we put our faith in. If we have faith in Christ, we can have confidence in that faith, and we can trust in the sovereignty of God and His grace. But not only co courageous faith and confident faith, but concerned faith. Being burdened for others who are lost. Do we really care that people are going to hell without Jesus? Do we really care that there's, there's only two small churches in this whole city? And these people need the Lord. Amen? God's got us here for a reason. And finally... Covenant faith. It's a faith based on an unbreakable promise. Aren't you glad that God made a promise to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us? That he made promise to us that, that we'll close our eyes on earth and open them up in glory? That he made promise to us that he's coming back one day to take us home? Amen. Amen. A promise to us that we're going to spend eternity in heaven with him? That, he, that he's gone away and he's preparing a place for us? He spent seven days on the earth. He spent the last 6,000 on heaven preparing it for us. How sweet is that going to be? Amen? Can't wait. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for this picture of Rahab. A woman seemingly so far from you. But Lord, you loved her enough to send two spies into the land to make three million people wait so that she might hear the truth. And then more amazingly, she's in the line of our Savior. Our Savior is related to Rahab. What a great and awesome God you are. And it's an encouragement to all of us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Lord, you can take men and women like us, flawed and sinful, and make new creations out of us and use us for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, I pray that you'd light a fire in each and every one of us again. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Give us this kind of faith that's unwavering, unrelenting, that continues to be faithful even in the midst of the greatest trials and difficulties. We thank you, Lord, that our faith is tested so it can be trusted. Help us, Lord, when our faith is tested, not to run, not to be afraid, but just hold on to you even tighter. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and worship. Is he worried to be worshipped after that?